go on to, well, welcome to Directors Learning Council and Know Your Blind Spots. And it's only because of the recent um, uh, recent changes, really, that the, it brought this around, um, this idea of holding this webinar. So firstly, <coughs> because I had a conversation with Gary and Gary didn't seem to understand what a director's loan account, which for me is quite shocking, uh, being in the tax world, because it's quite, um, you know, uh, quite basic for, for those obviously in the tax world. Um, but it was concerning that a company director didn't understand the full significance. Then he went from that to Marco also suggesting something about directors' loan accounts. And with the increase in the tax, um, in tax, in national insurance and the dividends, and the fact that um, the changes and the impact on the directors' loan account also is not very well known. So I thought it'd be really good to put this webinar together where we have right from the beginning catering for company directors who don't know about director loan accounts to the significance, the impact, and then going right all the way through the journey of when the director's loan account is set up, um, what you can put in it, what happens when you have a tax investigation or HMRC asks questions about it, and right to the end where when the company is liquidated, what happens to the director loan accounts then? And in that you will have um, mentions about bounce back loans because that is another key current topic at the moment, which we've also um, put in this webinar. So, um, and that's where we got the idea from Know Your Blind Spots. And that's what we want to do. So we want to shed light on this. Um, so um, welcome to Marco, um, a, a very good uh, colleague, friend of mine. Um, he's a licensed insolvency practitioner. Sorry, not liquidator. I've been corrected on that. Uh, and uh, of course, you all know myself as a tax investigation expert. And um, Sean Daven, who's the first time we've had on this webinar, and is a very experienced forensic accountant. Um, he will be kicking off this webinar, starting on, because he's got a lot of knowledge in this area, starting off on what director loan accounts are. So, Sean, uh, if you want to uh, start off, and I'll put it on the next slide. Yes, thank you very much indeed, Jasmine. Very warm welcome to everyone else. I'm spotting some names that I see on the participant list. No doubt we'll engage further later on. Now, we'll kick off if we may, with uh, directors' relationships with their own companies. And they need to identify these days in real time whether they are owed money by the company, i.e. the director is a, a company creditor, or whether they, the director owes money to their own company, i.e. a company debtor. Um, if we can go to the next slide, uh, Jasmine. I'm trying to if you will listen to me okay okay yeah <laughs> all right now just some terminology um directors loan accounts and directors current accounts people sometimes think and when i say people i mean our clients directors of companies they think there is a difference between directors loan accounts and directors current accounts of course we know there isn't it's just what people call them but in a straw poll that I did yesterday, and indeed Jasmine did the same with her contacts, I was, uh, J Jasmine discovered that 37% 30, of her contacts did not know what the director's current account was. And I've got to tell you folks, 67% of the 23 people that I polled did not know what a director's current account was. They thought it was a bank account. Um, uh, we discussed this, yeah, because it's because the majority of my network is actually accountants and tax agents. So yes. it would be surprising if they didn't know what a director's loan account um, was. So my voters, um, when I conducted the polls, uh, would be is coming from that um, area of knowledge. Whereas your one, I would say, if we had 100% company directors, and that's been commented on as well, commented on in LinkedIn, we would expect it to be a lot higher. So I completely agree with what you're saying. Yes, and um, the, 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 the five or six of them that knew what a director's current account was, all had accounting backgrounds, um, except, for, except for two, who knew what they were, 
only because HMRC had started inquiries into their directors' overdrawn current accounts. So the message to the majority of the people attending here today, the accountants, the tax advisors, etc., do not make assumptions that our clients know what we mean when we talk about um, directors' current accounts and, and more crucially, directors' current accounts being overdrawn. People related to bank accounts and not to the records uh, of all transactions that go through the accounts. So if we go, go to the next slide, if possible, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. If I may jump in there at the moment, our, our, we've done a straw poll in, in our guests here today. 88% uh, know what a director's loan is, 13% don't. Let's see if by the end of our, our webinar if those are the ones that don't understand. Sorry well, that's, to uh, that's really good real-time information, Gary. Thank you very much. And um, do you know why? Because the majority are like accountants and yeah, of course. agents, yeah. which yeah. is, you know, yeah. I'd be surprised if we, if we didn't have as high as that. I'd be mm. really surprised. Yeah. But remember, the message really is to the accountants, mm. get that message more and more out to your clients, because in this real time world that we live in, there is no such thing anymore as mopping up at the end of the year. You, you need to be monitoring these things with your, <coughs> your clients' accounts um, monthly, quarterly, etc. Now, why do we have directors' accounts and how might we portray that message over to our clients in, in a way that they get it quite quickly. Um, I've often found if I said sales accounts are to record sales transactions, purchase uh, accounts are to record purchase transactions, expense accounts are to record expense transactions, and guess what? Director's accounts are to record director's transactions. Uh, do, does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense to all of you. Um, on, on your go, Jasmine. Yes. Okay, uh, what is an overdrawn director's loan account? We've already said it's not a bank account, it's a record of all the transactions between the company and the director. So we would include in that not just salary, not just dividends, but those as well. But we'd also include money that the, that the director puts into the company, assets at a proper valuation that the uh, director puts into its company and it is his or her own company and also what they take out. Um, we seem to have uh, moved off the, uh, the slide there. Uh, thank All you. right, yeah. No problem. Um, can we go back to the last one? Yeah. Thank you. Um, The balance on any director's loan account or director's current account represents the money owed um, to the director if it's in credit, if it's in debit. I, I don't like to use those terms to non-accountants, but we talk, I'm talking mainly to accountants. But to those of you that are not accountants, when I say debit, treat as overdrawn, similar to an overdrawn bank account, but not a bank account. Uh, you owe money if something is overdrawn. And the crucial thing is, in the same way that if your bank account was overdrawn, there would be consequences. Similarly, if a director's current account or a director's loan account is overdrawn, there are also consequences to that. So uh, if we can move on, yeah. Thank you very much, um, and, and, and thank you also to your colleague uh, who managed to get this schedule on there. I really appreciate that. Thanks a lot, uh, Jasmine. Now, an example here of a director's current account, which is what accountants look at when they are preparing accounts for the company. You'll see at the top in this example, on the 1st of April 20, 2020, there was a thousand pounds owing to that director from the company. It's not in red, it's not bracketed. It was owed to him, the director is a creditor. As we move down, the salary for April is processed and the tax deductions and the net pay that was transferred to him are all appearing on the debit side of the account. So it really is kind of stupid simple. You add what is in the credit to the balance and you deduct what's in the debit column 
from the balance. And you'll see, if we just look at line eight there, box H, there is a thousand pounds still owing to the director as there was at the beginning of the year. Let's say in May, he's voted a dividend and we assume all the paperwork for the dividend is correct. That's another thing that uh, I'm sure Marco will uh, be emphasizing and indeed Jasmine will be emphasizing uh, later on when they speak. Mm -hmm. You add the £6,000 dividend, assuming it's been legally uh, voted and there are reserves to vote it and it is done in real time. That brings the balance to £7,000. You can see on this in this example on the 15th, he had £4,000 drawn out of the bank account, transferred to his personal account, his wife's account, whatever, leaves a balance of £3,000. However, they then decide to splash out. And whatever they do, they spend £15,000. They transfer that to uh, their own personal accounts. This, of course, triggers, and you know about this if you keep track of it, an overdrawn balance in the director's current account of £12,000. It stands out like a sore thumb on this account. Uh, in bracketed, in red, and narrated with OD beside it. Now, if you look to your right, you will see the accountants, and you will know this, but we'll go through it anyway. Those of you that aren't accountants, immediately you're triggering a liability, just to get technical here, section 455, but treat it just as corporation tax, of 32.5%. Now, that has jumped up in recent years. It was 25%. It's jumped up. So immediately, £3,900 should be lodged with HMRC to cover the £12,000 overdraft. Now, you can see as we work our way down the current account, the May transaction, how it affects the overdrawn balance and the, uh, the respective ACT liability, um, the Section 455 liability with the tax office. Mm -hmm. um, we then get to February. And this particular director has introduced six and a half thousand pounds. We spoke about them introducing assets or cash, uh, six and a half thousand pounds, which reduces his indebtedness to his own company to the sum of five thousand five hundred pounds. Now, I've also put 10 months payroll transactions into the last month of the year, uh, 25,000, which is two and a half thousand times 10, um, 25,000, and I've reduced I put in debit entries uh, to cover 10 months tax and national insurance transactions on lines 18 and 19, together with 10 months net pay, £20,000. So now the bottom line is he is also overdrawn at the end of March by £5,500. Unwisely, it would seem he or she draws another 7000 and we are at £12,500 overdrawn. Now that £12,500, the cumulative effect of that is that there is a corporation tax section 455 liability of £4,063 to be paid over to HMRC. Okay. You, you can of course um, repay uh, a director's current account within nine, year, nine months and one day of uh, the year end, and we'll talk about that later on. But if if you can move to the next slide, please. Um, thank you very much. Um, now, wh where do you spot, for those of you who are not accountants, where is it you see the director's current account balances uh, and whether they're good news or bad news in the formal financial accounts, the year end accounts, the external accounts, if you want to call it that? Well, if the, if, the, if the director's current account is in credit and the company owes the director money, which is good news uh, for the director, this will appear in creditors owing within a year. Um, if the director's current account or loan account is in debit, i.e. overdrawn, the director owes the company money and that balance will be shown as, as a debtor and normally narrated as other debtors owing within the year. Somewhere there will have to be a note that says other debtors includes X amount owed by director Jay Smith or, or, or whoever, <coughs> etc. And over the page, thank you again, Jasmine, for pulling this one together. 
um, you'll see where those uh, that, that, that there are obviously two directors in this company with opposing positions. One who owes his company or her company money, £6,999, and that stands out like a sore thumb there. By the way, these things always bring attention. They're never good news in my experience. I'm, I'm sure most accountants in the room would, would say that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the person who, the director who is owed money by his or her company appears un in, under other creditors in note six yeah. there. £6,900 owing uh, by coincidence, similar debtor and, and creditor position, but I assume they are different people. And I, I can um, say that all three of us would look at this straight away. Uh, Marco would look at this at his end, wouldn't you? And I definitely would look at this um, as someone at HMRC. Uh, as a caseworker, it's one of the first things we do. We look at the other debtors and other creditors, and then we will ask for a breakdown to see if there's any directors loan accounts, and that will be then looked into further. So yeah. it's, this yeah, is definitely one of the key information amongst all three of us. Um, that is is common. Is a common thing that we would look at. Yes. Yeah, so for for the, the account, this will be second nature to the accountants, of course. But to the directors in the room or non-accountants in the room, mm -hmm. I hope they're getting an awareness for the importance of how their directors' affairs are conducted and what significance they themselves need to um, attach to addressing the directors, their own directors' affairs with their own company. If the proverbial happens and it hits the fan, it, these, these areas, these transactions are going to be looked at. Hmm. And Josephine has already given her her, her um, spiel on that. And that part, <laughs> we'll, we'll do the same, no doubt. So uh, there we are. All right, on we go. Uh, the consequences of an overdrawn director's loan account or current account. As I mentioned when I was talking, when, when, I, was, when I was going through the schedule, um, the company must currently pay 32.5% of, uh, of that to HMRC. It can reclaim that uh, when the loan is repaid. It's called, it's called Section 456 uh, or 457 relief, I think, something like that. Yeah, Section 456. Um, Okay, I bow to the I bow to the investigation. <laughs> um, okay, you can reclaim that uh, if if uh, if it's repaid within nine months and a day of the year end. Obviously, if the Section Four Five Five liability is paid late, then there will be interest on that, and that uh, won't be won't be reclaimable ever. Um, for the director, there will also be a Section. A benefit in kind charge. People who are not accountants will connect that with the old days where they got charged benefit in kind for, for, for either medical insurance or for or, or, or for their fuel or for their car usage. It's that kind of non-cash benefit um, that they will be charged uh, interest on if they are paying less than the official rate, which since April was has been two percent. So if they're only charged a half percent or 1%, they would respectively be charged the tax on the saving that the 1.5% or the 1% has given them. So there's, if it's a small loan, it's not going to be that much. But if it's a, a substantial loan, you know, there, there could be a few quid to pay in, in, in tax there. Now, again, I know this will be, um, you know, fuel to the fire for Marco and his um, and his and his team and uh, people who, who who look into companies who've gone insolvent, if there is an overdrawn loan account, the tax issues are you know what they are. But what an insolvency practitioner and I'm sure Marco will 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 take over this point um, will do is he will be very he or she will be very interested in investigating that to see how if it can be increased and whether um, it can be uh, recovered from the director personally. And there is, you know, there are significant consequences to an overdrawn loan account if, if the director has financial cash problems, him or herself. Um, do, do you want to comment here on this, Marco? Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll go into a bit more detail, Sean, on the later slides, but 
you know, ultimately any money that's borrowed from the company, the appointed practitioner will have a duty to realise the company's assets for the benefit of creditors. As you quite kind of you know, correctly allude to in previous slides, uh, any overdrawn loan account sits as a, a company asset on the balance sheet and therefore the appointed practitioner has a statutory duty to pursue that asset for the benefit of creditors. Now, there will be some commercial aspect to whether or not pursuit is, is, is worthwhile in the creditor's interest, but certainly more often you know, than not, that proves to be the case. And you know, unfortunately for directors, um, fortunately for creditors, there are certain powers, significant powers within the insolvency legislation that enables the appointed liquidator administrator to pursue the individual. Uh, we'll come on to how that kind of uh, fits in with other transactions that we're able to pursue, such as preferences, for example. There are all sorts of routes and antecedent transactions available to us. But yes, ultimately, I think that the sort of scary final sentence on this slide is, that, you know, worst case scenario can result in things like charging orders being taken against personal properties or even bankruptcy petitions being served. So uh, absolutely spot on, Sean, serious stuff to be playing with. Yeah, and of course, that old favourite, uh, transactions that are under value and uh, such like. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, um, Jasmine, unless you have anything to say, uh, we'll, we'll move on. Um, um, uh, I, I think we, uh, Marco, um, the reason why uh, I've asked, um, we've got Marco on board today is because um, a lot of, uh, of the accountants and company directors are unaware of the impact that um, having an overdrawn director's loan account can have when the company goes insolvent. So I think he's he he will go into it more detail, and it's it's particularly I think relevant and important. Um, and he's the best person to go in more detail in that in, in that. And we will yes. will do later on. Yes. Um, so it um, because I wanted it to have um, this this webinar to like have a span over the impact of director's loan accounts and, and taking loans out from the company. So I've added in about the loan benefit in kind as well. So if you've got a loan of more than £10,000 and you're a shareholder um, and you owe your company more, so there's a de minimis amount in regards to benefit in kind. So you would have to treat that loan if it's more than £10,000 as a benefit in kind, you would have to deduct class one national insurance. And again, it shows here where the 1.25% increase has an impact and that will be relevant from April, 2022 onwards. So it has an indirect impact here in regards to the benefit in kind. You have to report the loan on your personal self-assessment um, and you may have to pay tax as well. Um, especially if you paid the interest below the official rate. So you would have to calculate the difference in the um, in the difference and then the tax on that small amount. But um, saying that, sometimes it is a lot more cost effective to do it this way uh, rather than take an official loan out from somewhere else, for, for example, a bank. But this is the um, this is the procedure in declaring a benefit in kind in regards to amounts of more than ten thousand pounds, and there's a de minimis on um, loans. So anything below ten thousand pounds is you know there wouldn't be income tax on that, but anything above that as a benefit in kind they would be, and so so I think that's quite important to understand that in regards to um, tax in uh, consequences. Um, in regards to benefit in kind, uh, the de minimis, uh, de minimis sorry, uh, amount will be £10,000. I put my teeth back in, sorry. <laughs> um, right, we had an interesting discussion about this, uh, and I've put this in there just to uh, cause a bit of controversy, really. Um, can a DLA actually be written off? Um, and so if both of you, Sean and Mark, if you want to jump in, please, you're welcome to do so. So I, I looked into this option. Uh, I haven't had this happen on any of my cases as such, and it's definitely not one I would recommend. Um, but uh, it is as a process, it does exist, um, but it can be more costly uh, as a result. So, I mean, if a DLA account, a, D a director's loan account is going to be written off and it's overdrawn, it has to be formally waived. So you can't do it like off the cuff kind of thing. Oh, I, I'm going to just write it off and not put anything in as officially. 
Um, if there's nothing, no available profits uh, to distribute, it's called a deemed dividend. Um, you'd still have to pay, pay national insurance on the amount that's overdrawn. So regardless of the fact that it's um, there's no profit to actually to distribute, it's still a deemed um, dividend. And uh, so the 1.25% again would have an impact here from 2022 onwards. Again, the same procedure, you'd have to put it in self-assessment in the additional information page and for income tax purposes, it'd be treated as a dividend, but no corporation tax relief would be given uh, for uh, as a write-off. So um, you won't, there wouldn't be any relief there as, for example, you would with a bad debt. Um, but, um, well, the bad debt is, it, it depends. Again, that has to be uh, follow a procedure after six years as well. But in this case, there wouldn't be any, which can um, end up being a bit more expensive, perhaps in that in that respect. But um, if we're looking at an insolvent position, um, someone like Marco will definitely look at that um, transaction if the D DLA has been written off and is it, uh, you know, is it um, really been... Is, is, yeah, is Jasmine, it just to, to sort of yeah. throw a few comments from the insolvency practitioner's viewpoint, mm -hmm. you, won't, you won't be surprised to hear I don't get comfortable at all with the uh, potential of a director's loan account being written off. You know, one of the first things that I would do upon any initial inquiry would be to review historic accounts. And uh, I, I quite like how Sean uh, sort of pointed out where you would find an overdrawn loan account in a set of accounts, because mm -hmm. one of the first things that I jump towards when I look at a new inquiry is what's the other debtor's position in the accounts? And actually is what the director is telling me about the financial position of the company actually correct if i went back three years for example and other debtors were showing at a hundred thousand pounds due to the company and all of a sudden within the last set of financial accounts you know that amount had disappeared or there was no there was no kind of tie up between point a and b um there are lots of other powers within the insolvency legislation that still allow us to pursue those amounts regardless of the fact that the director claims to have potentially written off that loan account um you mentioned before uh, insufficient reserves so mm -hmm. um, something known to the insolvency world as illegal dividends essentially yeah. just dividends that have been either declared and taken or or in this case you know it deemed to be a dividend um, in the event the company's got creditors i.e insufficient reserves and is unable to meet those liabilities those can be pursued as illegal dividends regardless of the fact as to whether they started off as a loan account or or were an actual dividend um, the moral of the story is the company's not got sufficient money to pay its creditors and pay its liabilities of course the legislation is not going to allow the directors members just to draw money out and run off into the sunset it doesn't happen mm -hmm. that way unfortunately for obvious reasons sean also okay. touched upon earlier uh, sorry, Sean, just to go back on the on the transaction and undervalue point, you know, that is essentially a section within the app that allows the appointed practitioner to pursue um, anything that may have been given as a gift or for significantly less than market value to a director or non-connected, connected party. We've got various powers available to us. And ultimately, we touched upon this when we spoke a few days ago. If it doesn't quite feel right in the director member's gut that you shouldn't be taking that money in the event you can't pay all of your liabilities, naturally there's generally going to be a transaction that allows the appointed practitioner to pursue you to overturn that position and uh, ultimately get the money back in for the benefit of the company creditors. So even if there, it was formally waived and you can see class, uh, class one national insurance has been paid, uh, from the director's perspective, uh, it's been um, recognised as a deemed dividend. <laughs> Um, and it, there's no corporation tax relief. I mean, all of this process has been followed. You would still pursue that. Well, look, if it's a deemed dividend, then mm -hmm. essentially it sits as a dividend. So if, for example, I'm receiving claims from creditors that are six, 12 months old, and I review the company's financial position six months ago when that deemed dividend was, was deemed to have taken place, mm. if in the event that the money that's been taken from the company has, has prevented it from being able to pay its liabilities, and looking at age creditors, three, six, nine, 12 months, for example, mm. then technically we can make an argument that the company had insufficient <laughs> reserves at the time to have made that deemed dividend and pursue it as an illegal dividend, Jasmine. Okay. And yeah, the that's why. Payment. Yeah, well, look, you know, an illegal dividend similar to, to an overdrawn director's loan account or 
any other sort of misfeasance type transaction that has been taken to the detriment of creditors. Mm. Um, we will always consider suitable negotiation settlement, but ultimately, um, you know, these claims can be pursued through the courts uh, and enforced in the same way that you would you would anticipate to be the case. Sean. Can, can, I, can I just clarify here, and um, uh, uh, maybe Jasmine might be the person for this, but has the position on formally waived dividends been clarified in recent um, case law um, where, where deemed dividend was, was brought to the fore? I think the uh, definitely the courts have the tribunal courts have a position on um, illegal dividends definitely, um, but I'm not sure not really on formally waived. So that I would have to look into further. But it's okay. an interesting point because there's a process here um, that uh, can be followed, but it shows that at the end of the day, it's the intention behind it, whether it's genuine or not, um, and the circumstances around it. So if it's just used as a way of, um, you know, taking money out uh, at will and thinking that there's not going to be re repercussions, then, then it's not going to ring true, is it? And See, I, I, can I, I, hmm. I, 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 my, my own take on that is mm -hmm. that over the last few years where directors' current accounts were, you know, um, in, in many years ago were really, you know, very, very poorly treated from a regulation point of view. I think the two ways where um, any deficiency in a director's current account would be amended would be by, um, you know, taking salaries out, mm. um, voted, of course, um, near, near the time of um, uh, liquidators being appointed, but before that. And of course, there is legislation now under what I call the regulations, Regulation 72 and Regulation 86, to transfer the personal liability for the PAYE on that clearing up salary uh, transaction directly to the, uh, to the director concerned. The employer's national insurance isn't, but the employee's national insurance and the tax, you know, gets transferred. And, th and that's for real. They really do do that. And of course, the deemed dividend now bolsters that. Um, and really, uh, the message to all the accountants that are listening and the message to the um, directors who are non-accountants, you know, really, I emphasize for the second time, you need to make sure your director's current account you need to know what it is, you need to know what it's made up of, and you need to make pretty sure, unless you've got a very good excuse, that it's in credit at all times. Mm. That's that's really the message, really, isn't it? Um, uh, definitely. Uh, I agree with you 100% uh, on that, in, in that respect. Uh, and um, but I do know on where it is transferred, there has to be indication of deliberate behaviour, so of um, to show that, uh, for example, in, in um, I've had uh, two two cases. One where the director was taking money out, not paying um, the wages as they should have been, um, but you can see evidence in their lifestyle, in their property purchases, the buying cars, and so on, whether it's of a deliberate behaviour or not. Um, yes. And so they do look at all of that, the whole circumstances and behaviours of the directors on there before thinking of transferring um, the liability personally in, in the director's name. So, yes, definitely. OK, which leads us um, nicely. I mean, to Tony Magritelli there has come up with a good point. Small company directors gamble on future profits when they simply withdraw funds and assume it will be covered by dividend. Says it all, Tony. Good yeah. point. And I, I would also say it doesn't apply to small company directors alone. Um, we'll, we won't mention any names now, but um, there are some big companies out there who have um, who've attracted well, um, yes. those lines. Uh, and, and I think that this is definitely the case with um, company directors who have struggled. <laughs> you said no mention names. Um, who have struggled throughout the uh, pandemic, have had no assistance but the bounce back loans uh, and have had to live 
um, off the bounce back loans as a result, um, and because they've not just had no access to, for example, universal credit, or um, the sales have gone down, trade is not performing well, and they've not had assistance with um, any of the COVID-19 grants either. So there, there are some uh, desperate situations which has taken place, yes. but, but we will um, definitely discuss that. So um, moving on to, we've seen how directors' loan accounts are formulated, what it actually entails, what does it mean, how does it, how would you recognise it on in the company accounts, um, and um, and the fact that to be overdrawn where you owe money to your company is not a, it's not really a good place to be. Um, there will be tax consequences as a result, um, and the reason why all that legislation was put in. Uh, where the section 455 tax is put in is is uh, in order for directors not to take advantage of that situation and use the companies um, like their own bank account really take money in and out whenever they want without any consequences so you have a temporary tax it's meant to be temporary tax section 455 which you paid 32.5 percent on the tax when you take it out and then when you repay the amount you you get that um, rebate um, in tax investigations, and most of the time, um, what we have is a situation where uh, we, where uh, the profits have been understated for whatever reason, can be understated, sales is just one example, but for whatever reason, the profits have been understated, it's been established through the accounts, and uh, what HMRC would ask is, where has the money gone? So you've taken money out from the sales, where has it actually gone? And if it can't be justified that it's being spent or incurred on purchases or expenses and there's no audit trail, uh, HMRC then will say, well, then we will assume uh, the director has pocketed the money. Um, they've taken it for their own use, to for their own living expenses, uh, because uh, you have not been able to demonstrate that the money has gone elsewhere. Most of the time, um, you find in HMRC approach, sometimes they just do it as a default uh, position. So that's when you would have to challenge that if there's evidence to demonstrate otherwise. Um, the difficulty here, I find, is when you have a, a, a compliance check or so tax investigation, it's done in a particular period, and then you can have HMRC going back, applying the results of one um, compliance check to previous years and then what you have is a situation where the accounts are virtually reconstructed several years after the fact um, and so in hindsight you will have an overdrawn director's loan account and uh, then you'll have a considerable section 455 position so as an example um, sorry to those I'm old school so uh, section 419 is there which is what it used to be named as but you'll have something like this um, an example where there's a declared turnover and it's these amounts and then you may have um, this was starting out 15% uplift because they were able to demonstrate that there were cells missing um, and so they then use a kind of broad brush uh, general approach, uplift by 15%. And so there's an adjustment on the top figure on sales. So you've got these adjustments going back all the way. And then you've got corporation tax 20% on the additional um, sales uh, adjustment. And then you've got a section 4 5 posi position. And um, um, you know it'll be considerably more than the corporation tax so it's almost like a double whammy um actually as well as the corporation tax you've got a section 455 position which would now be because before 2016 it's 25 percent but after 2016 it got uplifted as i'm sure a lot of you know to 32.5 percent hi carlos um and so uh the the issue is is that um, in the, when you've got a position of where there's an understated profits, the corporation tax can actually have um, a huge uh, impact in comparison to VAT because you've got the the corporation tax itself of 19 or 20 percent, and then you've got the section 455 position, which is considerably more at 32.5 percent and. Uh, at that time, it's quite um, difficult for a director to be able to um, to be able to repay that amount back. So then you will have a considerable section four five uh, four five five uh, liability unless the director has the funds to actually pay the money back. 
Yes, I mean, is it worth just sort of jumping in to ask the question as well? Because presumably, in a retrospective kind of calculation like the one that you've given to us here, mm. um, presumably if there's a backdating of, of effectively additional liability, there'll be interest and penalties applied in addition Definitely. to yeah. that position. And you can start to see from the total figures at the bottom, if you take those numbers as a cumulative, add interest and penalties, mm. you know, that's when people like me are getting the phone calls with regards to the six-figure claims that these directors of the companies can no longer uh, afford to pay back and have no option other than to liquidate. Mm. Because they become insolvent, because the figures become so huge. Mm. Um, if you think about it, the corporation, um, you've got the sales figure, uh, you've got the corporation tax, then you've got the section 455 um, position, then you've got the liability, which is a percent, the penalty, which is a percentage of the tax assessment. And so everything has a knock on effect. Then you've got the VAT side of things and you've got the penalty on that, that side of things. And sometimes uh, you've got pay as you earn um, side and then you've got a situation where there could be possible personal liability notices so I've, I've had cases where they've come to me and there was only a fat assessment and then I, I would say well there's going to be more it, do, it's not, it doesn't stop at the VAT, VAT position because at the end of the day you can only have one sales figure you can't have multiple different sales figures yeah, it's, it's probably tax. worth taking into context as well Jasmine um you know, directors out there may have been thinking, you know, crown debt effectively sits with the rest of the unsecured creditors, which was mm -hmm. the case prior to recently. But, you know, HMRC are now a preferential creditor. Essentially, they sit above all other creditors in the event of a company going into an insolvent position. And therefore, the prospect of HMRC regaining at least some of what's owed to them through a company insolvency from the company's assets once an appointed liquidator is in office, you know, becomes far greater than what it would have been a couple of years ago. So the revenue we, are incentivized to pursue. But we know, have a situation where, you know, um, the client has, uh, or the taxpayer has been advised, okay, the bill, it, it's just, you, it, your company cannot afford to repay this. But, uh, um, and then it's it comes to like directly to someone like you, Marco, without any challenge uh, at all of the figures as such. And that's where you need someone to come in and challenge the figures because it has a accumulative effect. So because the, like the penalties is a percentage or something, mm -hmm. normally like the sales addition you saw, you can see here it's 15%. So the 15% has a, an effect, you know, so if you um, uh, deal with the 15%, see how they reach those figures um, and minimize that, minimize the years, then it has a, another like consequential effect as well. Uh, and, and then if you reduce the tax assessment, you reduce the penalty and overall, so you, it's not as, as um, large figures that is first, um, first hits you. Because HMRC has, uh, has a habit of just doing very broad uh, generalized figures. And I know when I speak to just, you know, any person in my acquaintance, just the lay person who doesn't understand about this, and I'll say, oh, the HMRC is coming. They've uh, looked at the figures for one day. They've done an unannounced visit. And based on that one day or two days or one week, they've now assessed the company for the previous six years which sounds quite amazing to them when you when you say it like that. But indeed, cases have gone to tribunal. But, um, at, but the main thing is you have to challenge it. If you don't challenge it, then HMRC will just carry on with the figures they have. So that's the key takeaway. When you have a um, director's over, uh, overdrawn, um, uh, overdrawn director's loan account as a result of a tax investigation, um, you need to be able to challenge the figures at the end of the day before it even gets to liquidation. I, I know, um, Jasmine, we're talking about overdrawn directors' current account here in section 455 and, and mm. the double whammy you've set out so clearly there and how it rolls back over six years. By the way, you've got eight years there. You know, you're. You, you, well, you this one is eight years. Yeah, this is a different yeah. case. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the, the other, the other, there's a bit of a triple, triple whammy. I, I don't know if you said it or not, and forgive me if I, I, I missed it, but mm. looking at those turnover items there, approximately 1.9 million over uh, the eight years, 
15% uplift, it, roughly £300,000 in sales adrift, mm. on which there is output back deemed of um, a sixth plus penalties, probably another fifty to seventy five grand in uh, VAT money, you know, payable yeah. to the Treasury if it wasn't challenged. So uh, it's, it's, it's more than just um, the corporation tax. And all this comes about because um, people, people sought, for whatever reason, to avoid a minimal a minimal-ish type of tax at the time. Um, it, it just is never worth it. I mean, we've all moral seen of the story: don't don't uh, underdeclare turnover, folks. And, and interestingly, <laughs> in contrast to that, a lot of recently overdeclared turnover in regards to bounce back loan applications. Yeah. Will come on to one separate panel. <laughs> well, yes, that would be that would be uh, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? <laughs> Not worth the risk. You can well, start it's... writing your book now. Um, <laughs> it, well, it's no. just good to show that how, um, yeah, how it, I mean, Sean has started off saying that having an overdrawn director's learning cap is not a good thing. Um, but then you get a situation we have an overdrawn director's learning cap in hindsight as a result of a tax investigation that's taking place, which is, uh, you know, very difficult to combat um, in hindsight. Um, but the, it, it, this is definitely a big reason because of the Section 455 position, why it needs to be challenged. Um, but this is the impact it can have in, in a, a tax investigation. So um, I was saying earlier about the Section 456 repayment. Um, I wanted to just put across that this is meant to be a temporary tax, but it depends on whether you can pay it back. So I've given an example of where Director A is working full time, he's a, um, a participator and a working director in that he's a shareholder, basically he's a shareholder of the company. His loan account is overdrawn by £20,000 and this is where the accounting period is very, it's important to understand your accounting period because at the end of the accounting period, which is here, 31st of March 2012, you've got nine months and one day to make the repayment. So here we've got, oh, um, here we've got uh, um, £20,000 on is due on 1st of January 2013, but on, um, on 1st of January 2013, you've got £3,000 being paid back. So you'll get relief on that um, in time because it's been done within nine months and one day, but um, he's paid the rest of it on 1st of January 2014. So that will go into the following accounting period. So it's not a case of uh, you've taken the money out, you put it back and you get the section four, five, six relief or repayment straight away. Um, that doesn't happen straight away. That happens when, depending on the accounting periods, the nine months one day following the accounting period, which is basically when you file your tax return, um, your company on the company tax return on company house. So you've got them nine months in one day. And that, uh, at the same time, you would uh, be able to know where you are financially um, in terms of the company and whether repayment is due. And there's a box there that would say where you can claim back the um, the Section 455 tax on this. So I thought we just put that in to demonstrate that it's a temporary tax, that if you repay it back and when you would get the repayment, re repayment of the Section 55 tax. Okay. Uh Sorry. Sorry, Sean, did you want to? No, you finish here. Sorry. I, okay. I so I just wanted to say about the increase in um, dividend tax, which is um, going to uh, start in uh, apply from April 2022. So we've got 8.75% for the basic rate uh, taxpayers, 33.75% for higher rate taxpayers, and 39.35% for additional tax um, rate taxpayers. The £2,000 dividend allowance will remain, so that's good. Um, well, that's good in, in what we have at the moment. Uh, the Section 4.5 tax is also tied in. So this is was something that wasn't really explained by the government, um, that because the Section 4.5 tax, tax is tied in, the, higher, the dividend tax has gone from 32.5% to 33.75%. 
um, as a result. So it's had a knock on effect. And you've seen in the previous um, slides that the um, increase in national insurance also has a knock on effect on the benefit in kind position as well. So um, that is the impact that we can see all around on the in, that is relevant to the director's loan account. Okay, leading on nicely to um, what we were discussing about the bounce back loans, um, I'll hand it over to Marco. Yeah, thanks, Jasmine. Uh, just a quick word of warning: my internet seems to be playing up just at the point at which my my. Yeah, the, um, slides are due to come on, so hopefully you guys can all see and hear me at real speed. Uh, just give me a, a wave, Jasmine, if you've got any issues. But thanks for the introduction, and <laughs> really interesting to to hear yours and Sean's earlier slides. So, look, I'll, I'll just come on to what is uh, currently a significant anticipated issue insofar as um, the bounce back loan subject that we've all previously touched upon. Um, just bounce back loan in numbers, just over 2 million applications received, 0.5 million of which were approved. Uh, that equates to some 45, six pounds worth of funds out the door. Mm. Um, and ultimately, Jesse, still, can you still hear me? I can just about hear you, but don't worry, I'll fill in the gaps. You, we can make it into a game between us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's very frozen. resourceful guy <laughs> and he's gone <laughs> um what he was saying about that the um, value of approved facilities is about 45.6 billion um and then there's some sectors inside um 7.7 .7 billion to wholesalers retailers so they've actually broken it down to um, each sector, 7.1 billion to construction industry and 4.5 billion to professional scientific and technical activities. So you can see where the majority of the bounce back loans have been, um, have been um, um, granted. I can see some future risk assessment going on in the HMRC sector, That's, that is for sure. Um, and the default rate you can see is a whopping 50% uh, um, which is a huge amount, uh, and that is the uh, result he's seeing at his side from his impact, uh, where uh, because of the bounce back loans or whatever, and then they try to um, close the company as a result. So um, the headline issues on this is, uh, and, and I've seen this in our LinkedIn responses as well, that uh, what happens in a situation where the CIS grants were not enough to live on he was not employed, uh, but the loan is guaranteed by the government. So they think, OK, I've got no personal liability or risk in this event, and I've got no longer have the funds, so I can't be pursued for them. And uh, but did you actually know that one of the big four big four banks has already started seeking repayment of the bounce back loan in full where the borrower is under suspicion of having overinflated turnover on the application. And I'm quite sure uh, many of us have seen this or heard about it, where you know the dormant companies have, um, have had bounce back loans applied in their names or turnover has been inflated um, and to which I'm sure HMRC will also be very interested in that. Um, but we have a situation where um, companies have um, have uh, have um, oh, Marco's back, Gary. Yes, so just going to uh, bring him back up. Yeah, um, where where we have um, uh, bounce back loans being uh, granted, uh, and but the there's no the companies become insolvent as a re, as a result. So I'm not sure uh, when Marco's going to be able to come back in, Gary, because he says he's on. He says he's on. Uh, all he has yeah. to do is speak and he will come back on. But he's not coming up. Do you need to bring him up as a panellist? Um, let, let, me, let me work that. You carry on talking. You're doing a yeah, great he job. Said, Can you let me in? <laughs> all right. Knock, knock. All right. you, okay. carry on, you carry on talking and we'll so, do the technical um, stuff behind. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so what's the view of the insolvency service on directors using BBLS loan um, 
of funding on a reasonable basis to cover their living costs. And they would look at it on a case by case uh, basis, whether genuinely um, the director had no other source of income at all and and they had to draw um, the bounce back loans as a um, as as funds for reasonable living expenses what they would kind of frown upon is where you know you can see a, a vast amount of money fifty thousand pounds or so coming in it comes into um, the bank account business bank and then it's withdrawn on the same day and then it's spent all in one day or it's spent on a you know purchase of a house or purchase of a car that if they see evidence of that of what's happened to actually the um the the funding um that that um they would definitely look down on uh, because it's not genuine uh reasonable living expenses um and so they would have a duty the banks would have a duty to pursue that so it's not a case of okay we've taken the bounce back loan out um and mark has come back in the bounce back uh, loan out and that's it our company is not bringing in any money so we're going to take it out and make it insolvent it's not easy as that and i'm quite sure there will be uh, um, uh, a long risk assessment um, um, as a, a list somewhere with the names on them where they will eventually be looked into marco i've taken over your job Desmond, you're a star. Thank you. Uh, how did you find bluffing your way through insolvency for five minutes? <laughs> I was an expert did, for five minutes. Well. Well, done. Yeah. well done. Yeah. Well, well done. I'm used to you that from very HMC. well. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I apologise for my my poor internet connection. I am now via hotspot, so hopefully no issue. <laughs> um, look, would you like me to run over those slides for five minutes just quickly? Yeah, again? Um, I, I've gone back to. If you would explain okay. this slide a bit more, that would be good. Yeah. Look, interestingly, the hot topic at the moment is all about bounce back loans, as we all know. Just to put some context around uh, the figures, 2 million applications, 1.5 million of those applications approved, rightly or wrongly. I'm sure that will fall out you know, subsequently. From those applications that were approved, £45 billion of taxpayers' money effectively out the door. Uh, default rates estimated anywhere between 20 and 80 percent depending on what day of the week it is and who you're listening to um, let's take for example an average default rate of 50 percent that's some 750,000 companies defaulting on their bounce back loans um, potentially anywhere upwards of 22 billion pounds in default many of those default situations as Sean and Jesmyn have quite rightly kind of alluded to historically on previous slides will have some element of overdrawn director's loan account attached to them. Mm -hmm. Now, if you if you listen to what I am seeing, 90% of those companies defaulting on bounce back loans probably would have drawn out all of the monies within the space of a week of having received them uh, from the relevant bank on a personal basis and therefore owe that money back to the company. But that just puts into context by way of numbers. I think the problem or the issues that this country is potentially faced with off the back of the pandemic lending. And obviously, you know, importantly for those directors and their advisors listening today, we think there's gonna be a big fallout in terms of, of clients um, coming to the door of the insolvency practitioner where this set of circumstances may have previously sort of played out. Thanks, Jess. On to the next one, if that's okay. Oh, I went through this, this is okay. But, uh, yeah, okay. Just... What about the big, big four who's pursuing the bounce back loans? Yeah, look, we won't mention any names. I think it's been widely publicised, but, you know, there's a lot of scrutiny around those directors that have now taken, you know, clearly taken bounce back loans historically. And I think one of the big four banks has actually taken the step to where the borrower is under suspicion of potentially having overinflated turnover to get more bounce back loan from the, from the lender. They're actually recalling these loans in, in full. Uh, we're also seeing newspaper reports of, uh, police turning up to people's doorsteps in regards to criminally pursuing these bounce back loans that have been wrongfully misused. Um, a lot of misconceptions around the loans, and Jez, you, you touched on this earlier. The fact that you didn't have sufficient grants or couldn't otherwise furlough yourself, didn't have any money to live on, is not necessarily justification for the fact that you've got the loan and spent it on personal use. We will come on to, on a subsequent slide, uh, our trade bodies. Um, view of this and interestingly the insolvency service have taken what appears to be a sensible view so if in the event that the loan's been taken and and withdrawals of that loan through the company's bank account to personal accounts kind of follow the ordinary course of business 
that's seemingly justifiable. Where, for example, you've taken a bounce back loan and within the space of a few days, weeks, you know, subsequently drawn down on the loan in its full and that money never comes back into the company's bank account. That's where a more pessimistic view is going to be taken of direct conduct. Um, and that's where it's going to be a lot harder for directors to be arguing the case that that wasn't intentionally misused or, you know, not misfeasance. It shouldn't be pursued by a subsequently appointed uh, insolvency practitioner. So uh, lots of considerations. Um, but ultimately, I go back to the point I made earlier. If it feels right or it felt right at the time, then there's probably suitable justification. If what you're doing or did didn't feel right at the time, then you've probably got cause to be concerned. I think a lot of questions that are coming in is, um, uh, for example, if a someone has applied for the bounce back loan and then intentionally closed the uh, company down as a result and withdrawn the funds. Um, and the questions that have been asked is, will there be any repercussions? So if they don't go through an, an informal insolvency um, uh, process, uh, what happens to them? Yeah, it's a really good question. This is the benefit of retrospective le uh, legislation. So I think at the time at which the bounce back loans were were available, um, directors with bad intentions thought they'd be getting away with striking off the company without necessarily that getting picked up. The government uh, had a look at what was going on and through the coronavirus ratings legislation, retrospectively said they've got the power to effectively restore a company to company's house register for the purpose, purpose of investigation and pursuit. So, you know, if a bad intention director thought they'd get away with striking a company off, um, that did subsequently change through amendments, through legislation. And ultimately what it's done is bring a lot of these bad intention directors to the doorstep of the insolvency practitioner who know that the company hasn't got the ability to repay the loan, probably on the basis they've already taken the money out personally and spent it elsewhere. And we go back to holidays, sales of cars going up, extensions on back of houses, payments against mortgages. So I think, Jasmine, you know, Absolutely. simply getting the money and getting rid of the company, no longer an option, thankfully, for the taxpayer. Mm. Okay. Uh, um, director's loan account, I know you would have ran through this, so I'll very quickly just flip over, but um, they are very easy to spot. Sean's done a piece on an earlier slide in regards to where they normally sit within the company's account. If for any reason, you know, accountant, director, for some reason, hasn't shown this through the account, uh, one of the most simple things uh, and common things that the appointed insolvency practitioner will do is that we have the, the power to write to the company's previous bankers and obtain bank statements for as far back as we need to go. Very easy for us to see through companies' bank statements, uh, large transactions, amounts going out from the company's account to, you know, account numbers that will regularly kind of pop up. So. Um, even in the event of a director's loan account being missing from management information or from company uh, accounts, you know, the bank statement review will, will ultimately enable us to sort of finger um, when and where money's gone to, um, certainly in the absence of it having gone to company's creditors, for example. Um, I, I've definitely seen questions coming up about that. So um, not just from the insolvency practitioner, but also from the insolvency services as well, where they will query um, balances or money that's been taken out the company accounts. For what reason has it been taken account, uh, taken out of the account? So the, these are the questions that will have to be answered. And if you and if it's going down a wind up um, route where the company's wound up as a result of a petition from a creditor, um, uh, then the official receivership will eventually ask exactly the same questions. Yeah, well. it's important to note as well, because, you know, directors have been living off the benefit, the luxury of, of winding up petitions uh, being effectively uh, subject to a, a moratorium over the last 18 months. Well, with effect from the 1st of October this year, so literally within the last week, uh, the, the moratorium over winding up petitions has been lifted for any liabilities over £10,000. So, you know, we can't rest on our laurels directors uh, who may have sort of uh, been hoping that creditors wouldn't ever be able to come knocking again. That is something that is actively a, a risk with effect from last week. Um, and ultimately, uh, having spoken to HMRC relatively recently, as many as 30,000 company winding up petitions relating to HMRC debt alone in the pipeline. HMRC's biggest challenge will be one of resource 
as to whether or not they file a winding up petition against that company and will it likely return to HMRC as a creditor in the subsequent insolvency. So actually, it's quite interesting to see that because um, I've been asked this question about bounce back loan, what is the tax consequences? And I, I've, I've said uh, it's at the end of the day, it's a loan. Um, and so uh, it, it, in, in that respect, that ha there isn't any tax consequence in that respect because it's something that would go on the balance sheet. But actually, if you've withdrawn money out as a result and it's overdrawn, then yes, there will be tax consequences as that. And if you close the company as well and um, HMRC is the main creditor, then that will also be looked into as well. Because if you've taken, uh, if the company director's taken funds out um, and uh, they uh, and a considerable amount is owed to HMRC, then that is something else they would look at. Uh, automatically. Yeah. Jasmine, we've got a bit of a perfect storm, haven't we, with the, the amendments to IR35 legislation, personal mm -hmm. service companies, you know, 90% um, of personal service companies that are referred to me, they'll, they'll often be one creditor, mm -hmm. it's going to be HMRC, and yeah. the only asset in the company will be an overdrawn loan account, typically for the same amount due to the revenue, believe it or not, you know, mm -hmm. it's so commonplace that we see this type of scenario, and, and ultimately, the end result is one that we've been explaining throughout this webinar. Um, directors are going to be pursued to repay that liability. There'll be added complications for directors as part of the conduct investigation that the appointed practitioner has to go through because in the event that HMRC are the only creditor, there's also uh, investigation around something that we call trading using crown funds. You know That is reported as adverse conduct. If you're paying your other suppliers and everybody else with a view to continuation of trade and you've not been paying HMRC, that's something else that has a very negative view taken upon it for, for reporting and you know potential disqualification uh, remit, certainly. So um, if the uh, uh, overdrawn, if the director's loan account is in credit and you've taken bounce back loan out, but it's in credit, then, um, uh, then it's less likely uh, to be looked at when you're winding down. Uh, when there's, I mean, when there's a wind up uh, petition, the key thing is if there's an overdrawn director's loan account or um, money's been taken out um, and not accounted for from the company, then yeah, that's absolutely. when where's the risk? That's where the risk well, lies. You know, Jasmine, you have to ask yourself why. Why is this company in the situation that it's in? Why is there not available funds to meet its liabilities? If the answer to that question quite glaringly is because the director's taken all of the funds out for their own personal use, yeah. you know, then then understandably the risk of the director upon the business failure is greater because ultimately in nine cases out of 10, yeah. the finger could be pointed at the director for being the ultimate reason for it being in the position that it's in. So there is going to be um, uh, accountability from the creditors, basically. So it's not a free for all. It's not, oh, OK, I'm going to close it down. There is a going, it's going to be a consequence as a result of just going down that procedure and accounting to your creditors. I think the best advice I can give to directors that have taken a bounce back loan, uh, withdrawn those sums for their own personal benefit and maybe thinking about winding their companies up, is if there's any way that you can afford to repay those monies back to the company so you know the, the government has said will extend repayment for the bounce back loan to a period of up to six years on low interest rates if the company is not in a position to be able to afford to repay the bounce back loan over that six year period question has to be asked why is this company trading clearly it's either a zombie business that probably should have fallen over years ago or it's a company that's purely been been kept open for the purpose of using that bounce back loan for personal benefit. Directors beware. This this is I think it's going to be over the next 12, 18, 24 months and beyond. Not only questions asked of the government on the banks as to why some of these applications were, were so freeingly accepted, but clearly where the finger can be pointed at directors for having had improper intention, there's going to be huge consequence. Okay. Which leads us to Okay, I don't have a DLA, do I? I don't have a director's loan account. Yeah, I, I just want to finish on this because I, I, you know, through our position as insolvency practitioners, most of my referrals come from intermediaries, typically accountants. Mm -hmm. Often an accountant will uh, look to retrospectively at year end, convert a director's loan account to a dividend. Okay, so for some reason, on a monthly basis, directors are allowed to draw loans effectively and then we'll tally it up at year end it will be you know effectively through the accounts be declared as a, 
a dividend and will convert it that way. That's all great and well where the company doesn't experience any financial difficulty, isn't it? But if you think about the kind of things that can unexpectedly cause a company insolvency, so bad debt, for example, one of your customers does not pay, unexpected loss of trade, well, pandemic is a great example of how nobody expected overnight your business to be interrupted, but, but, but significantly was. Increase in, in costs. If you look at the energy sector at the moment, I'm speaking to a, a £50 million pound turnover provider of energy services last week alone, whose uh, four days worth of energy increases cost them £3.8 million pounds overnight unexpectedly. Mm. Unexpected supply chain issues. There are so many unforeseen events that can lead to a company going from a solvent position to an insolvent position, ultimately almost overnight in some cases. Um, uh, the point was raised by Tony on, on chat earlier. Why would you risk the company's future profit, you know, to give yourself comfort as to not falling into a, a risky position? I think the point here very much is similar. You know, accountants, directors, beware. If you are planning on drawing directors' loan on a regular basis and subsequently tying up at the end of the year, if something happens in that 12 months that, that means you fall into an insolvent position, mm. you're potentially, for the sake of a little bit of a tax saving per se or for it being an easier way of accounting, you're you're putting yourself in a position of risk that you shouldn't probably have to get into. And that's why you need to have um, up to date current information on your financial position, so you can take those key position uh, decisions. And it's something we see that lots of, um, hmm. as you say, we see lots of accountants who are now advisors, don't we, Jasmine, on LinkedIn on a regular basis, which is yeah. great because ultimately the role of accountant has gone from preparing year end accounts at the end of 12 months to being a yeah. more regular point of call yeah. in today's modern day and age where that's the case. Let's make yeah. sure directors are understanding the implications of, of a director's loan account. And let's make sure that regular management information, we've got all of this fantastic cloud software, exactly. you know, Zero and Sage and other, other certain software available. Yeah. Uh, let's make sure that we're using the technology to ensure that everybody's protected as they possibly can Exactly. Be. In this day and age, it doesn't make sense that you know where your company position is like nine months after the accounting period. Um, it, it's just not uh, It's just not feasible anymore. You need to have on, on point uh, information. You need to know like today, how much, what is my net profit today? What is my net profit been in the last several um, months or accounting period to understand what to make those key uh, decisions you need in, in order to improve your company's standard or, or standing or do better so it doesn't make sense not to have that um, information and that's why knowing exactly where you are with your director's loan account and um, again using the same key up uh, up to date current information is also important so you you're not overdrawn um, uh, Carlos brought an information, um, interesting point up earlier on in that when you're a sole trader and you incorporate your company, you do, there is a, like, there is a, because you used to, whatever is left over, that's your drawings. So that will be the money you're taking out. But it's different. There's a different attitude approach when you have your company, because then that's when the director's loan account is created. And if you go into negative, overdrawn, and then that's when you have can have these compounding uh, um, position and and tax consequences as a result of that. Hmm. You're right. I, I you're absolutely right. Accountants and clients should be having these conversations and ensuring that all eventualities are planned for. There is one other thing, Jasmine, that you need to ensure as well. A good internet connection, which I've clearly failed to have today, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, but you got us, so we carried you, don't worry. Well done, thank you very much. It's brilliant. <laughs> In this day and age, as well as up to date current um, <laughs> software, you need the internet to carry it to an excellent internet connection. Yeah. Can, I, can I also just intervene here and just say something? Um, all of the points that you uh, eloquently made there, um, Margaret and Jasmine, about uh, more regular management information proving that you've got net assets in your company, <laughs> that any dividends are done properly. Uh, with resolutions and the dividend vouchers to the respective people, etc. It's all very well having zero QuickBooks or whatever, perfectly valid smaller um, accounting packages as well that do the same thing. 
what you have to do, what you have to remember to do is to be able to prove at that time that that situation existed, not just print out a report later and then uh, hope, hope that's okay. What I would suggest is people comprise uh, or, or, or their accountants um, prepare a bundle of information monthly, perhaps sometimes quarterly, but monthly would be better. Um, you know, in the PDF world that we all live in, um, this isn't so difficult, but then to email it to themselves. So the email kind of date stamps or time stamps that information every month. It, it, you know, it's, 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 um, uh, it, it, it provides evidence of credibility that it was true at that time, subject to people checking the, the data. I don't know how you feel about that, um, Marco, being, a, being an IP. Yeah, look, yeah. absolutely agree. Retrospective um, review, documentation, you know, we work with the benefit of hindsight and, you know, often it's quite clear for us to go through documentation. You can see, um, you can certainly make an argument if something's not contained within the books and records in the first place and it subsequently, you know, mysteriously arrives via email. <laughs> board meeting minutes, supporting dividends, that type of thing. Uh, I, I would completely agree with you. You know, retrospectively, things being done is not the best bet. You know, full set of records, it, you know, even to some, something as simple, which has been highlighted in recent case law in our world, actually, in terms of a director's duty to keep proper accounting books and records, you know, something that seems quite obvious, but often you would be surprised at the amount of directors that fail to deliver up books and records or suitable books and records. And there's a lot of finger wagging that goes on between directors and professional advisors in terms of reasons why we don't have what we should have. I think the simple answer from an insolvency practitioner's viewpoint is to make sure that you have got everything that would be expected uh, of you in the context of being a director of a, of a limited company. Sure. And that brings us to the end to this webinar. We had a really great time. We've interacted with our people, with the audience, and there was a lot of questions. And I hope that explained um, quite well the beginning of how, what is a director's loan account? Um, how is it formulated? Um, how, where you have to look for it even in the company accounts to recognize are you overdrawn or not? Um, to the impact and the consequences if there's a tax investigations in that I have said it can be a double whammy um, to taking up bounce back loans and um, the impact of all the dividend tax increase and the national increase um, national sorry national insurance increase so um, that brings us quite nicely to the end of this webinar it was great to have you thank you Very.